I guess I'm about to like nerd out on you guys for a minute, but it's so fitting. Some of you guys know that I'm like a World of Warcraft nerd. I play WoW. I've played for years to be honest and like four years. I love healers. So usually I'm like a blood elf pally. Yeah, I'm for the horde. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like a week ago they came out with a new class for it and it's called the demon hunter. And so I, I, I did, I nerded out and I made a demon hunter. So this is my demon hunter. It's actually been really fun to play. I don't play as much as I used to. I just don't have the time. But if you're looking for a new guild, you know, I am the GM on my server. Anyway, enough nerding out. What's up guys? I have a bunch of questions from all of you that I have compiled and let's chat. <clears throat> it's my handy dandy little notebook. So this was, this was gonna, you know, I was gonna rant, and then I decided there's just no point to rant. If you guys follow me on social media like Twitter or Facebook or any of those, then you will know that somebody decided to message me on YouTube, leaving a comment saying that women shouldn't be paranormal investigators and they shouldn't be ghost hunters. He told me that I was not being very ladylike and he told me I needed to stop and start doing more feminine things. Excuse me? Do you know who you're talking to? Excuse me? Who? Who are you? So you know what, instead of getting mad, instead of getting, you know, any sort of upset and reacting, I am going to put a shout out to all of the paranormal girls, all of my paranormal girls that are out there right now. I talk to you guys almost every single day. I know that you're out there. I think I have created like the best, you know, community of female ghost hunters and paranormal investigators. For a long time I actually had, you know, a majority, like high majority was the male side. And now after all this time, like I've got all you girls out there that are like badass chicks that are following me and all of us support each other. So where are my paranormal girls at? I don't know what, you know, what does gender have to do with anything? Ladylike, well, I guess you got me there because you wouldn't want to hang out with me like on a day-to-day -day basis because I'm probably definitely not ladylike. I'm for sure like I love makeup and I love hair and I love fashion because I was into cosmetology. But yeah, you're right. You got me there. I'm not ladylike. I'm cool with that. I was always the chick that had like mainly dudes, mainly guy friends. I just admitted that I play World of Warcraft on social media. I'm not ashamed of who I am and if you think ghost hunting and paranormal investigating is masculine, then I blame the media for that because there is no female lead investigators out there. And I have told all of you guys over and over, that's gotta change at some point. So whoever you are, Mr know-it-all out there watching. Thank you for adding more fuel to my fire to just continue on the path that I'm on to hopefully create feminism in the paranormal. And you're right, I'm, I'm not ladylike. Anyway, moving on, let's go on to the next subject. I just want to address it because I thought it'd be fun, right? It was fun, right? Paranormal omens and superstitions. 
Okay, a lot of people, you know, have superstitions. A lot of people believe in omens, like the Grim Reaper. Uh, if you don't know about omens or superstitions, most of these actually trace all the way back to the Romans or even the Greek. So this is like, you think that you saw the Grim Reaper and um, it really was just some dude with a cloak walking down the street. Who walks with a cloak down the street? But because you saw the Grim Reaper, you're gonna die. Like, you're, you were completely convinced you're going to die. You're driving late at night and you see a black cat cross your path. And that's another omen. That if you see a black cat, like that's a sure sign for death. Crows, ravens. I, I think an, an old school one is when your bird flies into your house, someone in the household's going to die if, if the bird dies from like falling into your window. Think about how paranoid all of us would be 24 seven if we read into every little thing like that that we saw. Do I believe in any of these omens that I just talked about or any omens in particular? No, I can't say that I do. In fact, I have now owned two black Bombay cats. My first cat I had, um, I got him in like second grade. His name was Max. And Max lived to be like 19 years old. Like he was an old man and uh, sadly he passed away in my early 20s, but then a few years ago, my cousin's cat got pregnant and I went to go pick out this cat. So I picked out one of the kittens and he was so tiny and cute and it was the only boy in the litter. And he was like this big, like if you've ever seen little tiny kittens, he was like this big. And he was um, gray and white and I actually named him Fade. And the reason I named him Fade was because um, his head was white and the rest of his body was gray and he faded from um, white to gray. And then slowly over time, my freaking cat turned out to be this giant 28 pound panther Bombay cat. So actually that's kind of funny if you're talking about like superstitions or omens or predictions. When my cat Max died, the last day we had him before we had to go put him down. He like, he wasn't eating, he wasn't walking, like he, I mean, I, I like to think to leave things or beings natural, like let them naturally go, but like he was suffering, like he was just a bag of bones. And so the night before I took Max in t um, to the vet, I, I literally sat down with him for like an hour and I was like, Max, I want you to know I was like, I really love you so much. I'm so sad you have to go. And I said, but if there's any way you could come back to me someday, I'm not going to look for another cat. I'm just gonna let it happen naturally and, and I hope that you come back in my life. So I went to my cousins, I got this little kitten thinking it was not a black Bombay cat and this cat turned into a, a panther bigger than Max and Max was a giant Bombay as well. I don't know if it's Max reincarnated. They have the exact same temperament, the same personality for sure. They're both giant cats, but Fade is my cat and he he's my baby and uh, he's, he's a big boy. Do I think black cats cause death? Well, if that were the case, then I've had a, a black cat my whole life, so I think I'm good. So no, when it comes to like silly superstitions like that stuff, I don't believe in that kind of thing. I do believe that we as humans can develop our own omens and superstitions over time, but it's really personal and specific to your life. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna give you an example. When I was like, let's see, I was like 20 or 21, I had bought a car, I bought a Mustang. It was a blue Mustang. And, cause I've, I've only ever driven Mustangs, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I had this Mustang and I had uh, the same day that I got the Mustang, I was given this necklace. And the necklace had this like fancy antique um, key on it. It was like the old school keys that they would have used like in the hotels or whatever, you know, back in the day. It was not a real key. It wasn't used for anything. It was just a giant key. I wore that necklace forever. I don't know why. I just wore it forever. So every day, like in the shower, every, all the time. All of a sudden one day, like nine months later after I had bought my Mustang, I realized that the key had broke off the necklace. 
Now it wasn't like a gold, it wasn't even silver, it just, it was, you know, costume jewelry. And I don't know where I, I lost the key, but for some reason, that made me really paranoid in my head. And I don't, I don't really know why. I went home that day and tried to get it off my mind. And I woke up the next day and I went to leave to go to work. And as I walked outside of my house, I usually had, I had parked my Mustang in the driveway and my Mustang was gone. Brand new, brand new Mustang. And so I'm like, I, I, I can't tell you guys how that feels. Like unless you've had a vehicle stolen or like repossessed, like I can't tell you how that feels. It's surreal. Like in your head, you're like trying to like make sense. You're like, did I park it down the street? Did I, um, did I get drunk down at like the corner bar and like leave it there? No, I didn't, I didn't do that. Just like you're like thinking like, where did I put my car? Like as if it wasn't there the night before. My car had been stolen. It had been stolen and uh, I, I did get it back in a couple pieces. It had been wrecked. It, it was really badly wrecked. So anyway, um, you know, maybe a year or two down the road, obviously I didn't have that car anymore. I had uh, just rented my first like out of out of an apartment, I'm in a townhouse now um, with my boyfriend at the time. And so, I, I the same day once again, I got a necklace key from a family member. And honestly, I'm not really correlating this at that point. I wore the necklace, and one day I was at work. The same thing kind of happened again. Um, the the key broke off from the necklace. When I had gotten home that night. Someone had broke into my apartment. Now once again, that wasn't a real key. It was just like a looky-loo necklace. The same scenario happened a couple years later. I was given a necklace key. The key broke off. One random day in that same day, my house was broken in. My own superstition at this point, I am like, I don't believe in coincidences. Like when things like that happen like over and over and it's a similar situation, I don't believe in coincidences. Like especially being in the industry of like the paranormal and the supernatural, I refuse to have a key necklace or anything that looks like a key in my house. I absolutely refuse it. And I used to love keys. Like I, I used to just like, um, you know, wall art that was like metal wall art of keys. I refuse to have any of that in my house now because it like, it freaked me out so bad. Like I don't want to ever have to go through any of that scenario again. So that's my own superstition. An omen, like, you know, I've, I've had omens before, but I they're not like um, the Grim Reaper walking in or something like that. I told you guys this before. My cousin died in June of this year and two weeks, for two weeks before my cousin passed away, I was having dreams that someone was going to die. And I can't tell you what the dreams were. It wasn't like I was interacting with my spirit guide or a person. It was just a dream. And in the dream, I don't, I don't know if it was like my voice in my head, you know, when you dream or what, but I knew someone was going to die. So for two weeks, I'm like, I'm talking to my mom. I'm, I'm telling Blake. I'm like, something's gonna happen like I just know something's gonna happen. someone's going to die I couldn't tell you who it was I didn't I wasn't like predicting like I'm not claiming to be psychic whatsoever I was just having this dream over and over of, of someone was gonna die so we were always on the phone like with our family like how's everybody doing everyone was doing fine and then all of a sudden sporadically we get a phone call that my cousin passed away in the middle of the night randomly no one you know it was not planned it wasn't expected it was definitely not expected and um, basically he went to sleep um, he overdosed on pain medication it was an accidental overdose and uh, he went to sleep and never woke up and because it was the evening before nobody found him until the next day and um, I mean I don't think he could have been saved at that point anyways but since everybody was in bed by the time they had found him was like eight or ten hours later uh, he hadn't gotten out of bed. He was completely cold and like rigor mortis had set in and um, it, we were shot like we were stunned because it was a situation where nobody could have prevented it. It wasn't like when you see a family member like pass out from choking or like have a heart attack and drop to the floor and like you can call 911 and try to prevent it from happening. It happened eight hours ago. There is no reviving this person. 
and there's it's completely out of your control completely so it was a very strange situation for me um the other thing was is that my cousin was younger than me so it was really hard um like the first time you have a family member die that's younger than you it's just it, it's weird it's just really strange that was really hard um obviously it wasn't my fault i mean i didn't it's not like i could have predicted that but it, it was it was like a sign that i was getting the reason i'm bringing this up is that Last week I had some weird stuff happen. Some of you guys follow me on social media, some of you don't. I was going to write a blog on my ghostgirldiaries.org, but I thought, you know what, I should just like chat about this with you guys because so many of you were interacting with me on different platforms of social media and when I was able to finally research it enough, I thought, I, I was like exploding wanting to talk about it and, and tell you guys about it. In case you don't know, um, about a week ago, my mom was in our backyard and um, she she had taken my dogs out to go to the bathroom or you know hang outside or whatever and she started to shout and if you couldn't tell by now Blake and I live together um, and we've been in a relationship for four years uh, she's shouting and screaming so Blake and I ran to the door to see what was going on and she said that um, something like she thought there was like a bird attacking another bird or something we just she couldn't tell and there was an injured bird that was on the ground. Blake was a combat medic um, in the army, and so he ran to go see, well, we both ran out to go see what was happening. Now, the, the portion of my backyard is, is really big. Um, it's really, you, it takes a minute to get to it um, really far, like maybe, maybe 25 feet, something like that. So as we're walking up to this injured bird, there's an injured bird on the ground. On our back uh, fence, there is a jet black hawk. I mean jet black. It looks as if the hawk would have been hunting this bird. The time that it takes for you to walk to where our back door is, all the way over to where this bird was on the ground, if the hawk was in fact hunting this bird, it could have swooped, it would have had plenty of time because of the length we had to get to it. The hawk did not go after this bird once. So Blake is more concerned about the bird on the ground and I'm watching the hawk. So Blake's on the ground um, looking at the bird. It's not bleeding. It doesn't have a broken neck. It doesn't have a broken wing. Um, there's no signs of trauma. There's no broken legs. So Blake puts, he kind of cups his hands like this and this little bird um, ends up jumping into his hands. And that's when we realize that it's a, it's a sparrow. It's not a baby, but it's, it's a sparrow. Now, I'm like getting really upset because you guys know I'm an empath and like I get really, I don't like death like that. You know, like I don't like any sort of traumatic death or anything like that. Of course, I'm getting emotional and like choked up. And this hawk, I'm talking black hawk, is huge, like huge, huge. And he's standing on um, the ledge of of our fence and we have like big concrete fences they're like they're not typical six foot fences they're like um, about eight foot fences and the reason they have those in Vegas is most people have like swimming pools and like backyards where they have like you know friends over because it's you know 70 degrees in December here so that it's kind of always pool weather here pool, pool season weather and so this this hawk is huge and it's sitting up here and he's got his wings out and he's like He's doing this like up and down thing and he's it's kind of like dancing back and forth across the fence and he's looking at me and he's just watching me and I'm like so confused to like like if this if this hawk's wanting to eat this bird or whatever it could have done it like and and on now we're like just a few feet away from the hawk and the hawk is not afraid it's not it's not trying to fly away it's not um it's not intimidated, it's not threatened. So finally the hawk starts like squawking. Now it's not a squawk like a, it wasn't like I want that prey, it wasn't like it was yelling at us. It was like, it was just like a kind of peaceful communicating. And so Blake is like just worried about the sparrow because it's like, it's it's on the ground. It, it looks like it can't fly, we can't get it to fly. We don't know what's wrong. And I'm like, what do I do with this hawk? Like, I don't know what to do. So I went up to the hawk and I got really close to it. And it did this like bow thing and it like, it like closed its eyes, the hawk, and they're huge. 
Um, it wasn't an eagle, it was definitely a hawk. And it has the beak and it did this like head bow. And then it looked at me and then it turned and flew away. And I'm like, I'm in such a weird emotional state. Cause like on one side I'm like, oh my God, this poor, poor bird is like, something's wrong with it. And then on the other side I'm like, what the hell was this thing, like this hawk thing about? Like, and then I'm like, Blake's upset cause he's trying to help the bird. And then I'm just like emotional. So Blake's like yelling. So Blake has it picked up and it's very gently, it's in his palms. And it's alive and it's chirping and it's, it's it sounds like it's singing a little bit and chirping. Once again, there's no visible injuries. <clears throat> so Blake looks at me and he goes, I need you to go in the house. I want you to grab a towel. I want you to get some water um, and then get a little box because I think we're going to have to take it to a vet. So in the meantime, I told my mom to get on the internet and start looking up vets that can help. There's a lot of wildlife reservations here. So I'm in the house. Now I'm crying. Like I'm full Oprah crying. And I'm like, uh, I, don't, uh, I need like any water and I need a bowl and like I'm like just can't. So all of a sudden, I don't even know it was like, it was like some tranquility came over me and I was like, I can't control this situation at all. So I said, what is the only thing that you can think to do that can help this bird? other than like you know us as humans and the first thing I thought was well I'm gonna shout for Saint Michael to come down and who's the Archangel you know he helps like I told you guys to use him like he's my homeboy if you feel like you have anything dark or negative in your house Saint Archangel Saint Michael will come down and like remove that shit like really quick um, he's basically the Archangel that fights demons or the dead or anything that's dark that you don't want in your house or around you and then I called for Saint Ariel, and Saint Ariel is, um, she's the archangel of like nature and animals and, you know, anything outdoors. So I start like crying, and I'm like, because I, I don't know what to do. So I'm like, I'm like, you know, Saint Michael, Saint Ariel, please come down and help this bird. I don't know what to do if it's in pain, um, and we can't help it. Please take its pain away. Please help it, help it cross over. Please help it. Um, I mean, you know, I didn't know. I was just like spouting off whatever I could think of. So now by the time I've like circled the house to like get everything that, that he's asked for, I go rushing outside and Blake looks at me and he's got the little sparrow in his hand and he's like, he's like, he passed. And I was like, lost it. Like crying, like I was so upset. So we had to have like a little funeral and like all, it was just, it was so sad. He said that he looked up at him and chirped at him and just, set his little head down, closed his eyes, and just, and that was it. He stopped breathing. Um, we watched him for, you know, a while to see if maybe he just, he was going to get better, and he didn't. And so after a while, when we realized, you know, he was definitely gone, we had a little burial ceremony for him. I couldn't help but think after this happened that it was related to something spiritual. And I didn't really know, I didn't want to sound crazy and like jump to conclusions. So now a couple days goes by. Blake had gone on a business trip, um, and he had some other personal stuff he had to do, and he came back. So I was trying to tiptoe around in the one side of our house because I was trying to like not wake him up, you know? And so all of a sudden, I hear this like huge wham! And it came from our bedroom. And so I didn't know what it was and I'm trying to be quiet and I have no idea, like I thought one of our dogs ran into the, the wall, I didn't know. And so I go running over to the patio and I'm looking out, we have like a from our master bedroom, we have a patio door out there. And I look down from the patio door and there's a freaking bird that must have ran into the door. And it is now dying and like clutching onto life. Oh my God, I cannot take any more dying birds. So I'm like, oh my God, I know Blake's asleep. Start screaming for him to get up. And so he's like half awake, like I was trying to let him sleep. He had like a really long few days. Um, and I was like, oh my God, I'm like crying. I'm like I can't do this again. And so I, I started doing like the St. Michael, St. Ariel thing again. Um, 
he goes outside to, to calm the bird. Basically, we did the whole scenario again where I went to like get some water and get, you know, see what was going on. By the time I came out, the bird had passed again. This time, the bird that died was a white dove. So I know you're gonna ask questions like, what do these mean? Did you look up the meaning of them? I did. Some of it, you know, could definitely be contributed to the meaning that's behind these spirit animals or totems. And I'll share that stuff with you guys. But I think it actually goes deeper than that. So hawks, okay, are considered to be messengers, angels, they're divine. They like you, you know, if they come around, they remind you of what's ahead or focus on what's ahead. They usually have leadership roles. Um, they basically are there to teach you to fly higher than you ever have before. They remind you to have visions and be intuitive. Make sure that you start focusing at the task on hand is kind of the theme behind what they are. Um, more than likely, when you see or have some sort of a interaction with a hawk, it's a messenger from the other side or the spirit realm. Basically, um, take the lead when the time is right. The time could be now. It's a strong connection with the spiritual world and it increases your awareness with the spiritual world. A sparrow. This is reminding you to find energy, remembering you to have your passion within yourself, be vigilant, be hardworking, be productive. Um, any accomplishments you have, make sure you be proud of those. Recognize what your self-worth is. The, de the death of a dove, especially specifically a white dove, is usually the death of a spouse or the death of a partnership or relationship that is or was close to you. It also reminds you to be peaceful within and then you will have fortune for the future. So what does that all mean? Like that can mean a lot of things, right? Well, it, it, like I said, it goes deeper than what you think. I have some really awesome friends that are super spiritual that help remind me to stay on track in the paranormal because I feel like it's not just ghost hunting. Like if you're interacting with the other side, you really need to remember to heighten your awareness or heighten your spiritual self by meditating, by yoga, by um, you know, continue your learning and education in this field and in the spiritual realm. This friend that I called, I told her what happened. So she's trying to, we're trying to depict, you know, the puzzle of, of what this means. I've told you guys before that I'm Cherokee Indian. Ancestors all were basically from Oklahoma and then before that, like Georgia. I am registered with my tribe still. My family's original name was Fishing Hawk and they actually most of the time only went by hawk. So if you're not familiar with you know, American Indian lineage or heritage, most of the time last names that were made up by American Indians were usually in correlation to nature or animals. So my family's original name was actually the last name, Fishing Hawk Bear, and then it got changed to just Fishing Hawk, and then some of my family just goes by hawk. Super creepy. Um, to be honest, when I saw the hawk, that thought of knowing my family's history, I immediately knew it had something to do with them. Especially the way that this hawk was interacting with me, the way it was dancing, it was making very direct eye contact, and then at the end it did this like bow thing, and it almost looked like it was watching Blake and I to see what we were going to do with this injured bird. Did the hawk put it there? I don't know. Did he drop it there? I don't know. There was still no visible injuries to the bird. I think the bird ended up dying from just like a heart attack. The hawk watched us. It wanted to see would we leave it? If we see something injured, are you going to leave it? Are you going to pick it up? Are you going to try to help it? Um, and then it was like when it knew we were going to help it or save it or whatever, it did this like weird bow thing and left very 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 strange or, or you know was it in correlation to, to me calling for Saint Michael and Saint Ariel I don't know the hawk had to have represented my family and or myself the sparrow is very strange Blake was in the army for six years he has a lot of tattoos most of them are related to him being a combat medic he has stories for each one the first tattoo he got in the army was two sparrows on his back. The sparrows on his back um, are basically, um, they're even. They, they're basically meant to be wings, like may you fly, may you fly peacefully and passionately with your career in life. Now, do I think the death of the sparrow is like significant? Like 
does that mean the end of a relationship or that Blake's gonna die? No. I think that honestly, the injury for Blake, or the injury of the Sparrow was something related to Blake to remind him that he was a combat medic and he is still capable of, of taking care of something injured. The whole thing was really spiritual. Once again, I don't believe in in coincidences, and then a few days later, this dove flies into the wall and it, it dies. I, I'm not going to go into a lot of details because this is not my place to do this, but Blake has been going through a custody battle with his ex-wife. The day before the dove died or flew into the wall, Blake had court with his ex-wife. I have to assume that the death of that one has something to do with that relationship ending. I mean, they've been divorced and separated for many years, but now... You know, they're going back to court for, for custody. It's been a very, very interesting, mind-opening couple of weeks for us. I feel like the hawk was to remind me that I need to keep working on myself. I need to keep working on Ghost Girl Diaries. I love interacting with you guys more than anything. Like, I want to turn this into, like, a full-time job because it's passionate. Like, it's, it's what I like to do. It's fun. So what I did is I basically took the advice of this hawk and I started to continue to remember to work on my spirituality. I've been meditating in the mornings and the evenings. I've even been doing yoga. I've been doing other stuff to kind of try to make my spiritual awareness and growth continue to happen. And so I challenge you guys to do the same thing. Things around you, and the point of this is that omens, or even if it's like the death of birds, they're not necessarily bad omens. It's not happy to have a dead animal near you. Nobody wants to do deal with that. I've had to bury two I've had two funerals in my backyard in the last week. But you know, maybe you need to really maybe it's it's signs. I mean, I really have to believe that the industry that we're in, things get way deeper than just communicating with the dead. Watch for signs like that in your life. Okay. Paonia footage. You guys are wanting to see the Paonia footage. I talk about the Bross Hotel. I told you guys that um, I had a ton of footage, but it was kind of ruined from Mr. Chatty Cathy. A bunch of you have messaged me begging me to post it. Okay, I will post it, but you are not allowed to <laughs> make fun of anybody. Um, luckily, I always, I have anybody that works for me sign contracts. So legally, I can, legally, I can use that footage, but all I'm going to say is that um, there's a lot of talking. It's not the way I ever run, you know, filming shoots. I will post the full episode of The Bross Hotel. Mortis is out there, and Mr. Mortis, I'm giving you a shout out because you said that you've had complications with investigators um, drinking on set, basically out of flasks behind your back before you get to do an investigation, and Mortis told me he understood my pain because he said that he had investigators that would sing and stuff and it would, they would act silly and you're trying to do an investigation and, and they can't take themselves serious. I think it's just a really good topic uh, for me to just mention that if you ever do an investigation or you're running an investigation or whatever, I run my film sets pretty strict and here's why. When I have a production team and or investigators go out, it's usually six to ten people. Because I'm the business owner, because I own all of the filming equipment, ghost gear, whatever, I do pay for gas to the location, stay at the location, and food at the location. But if I'm going to pay to go hours away, take all of these, this equipment out, do all this stuff, there is no way in hell it's going to get ruined because somebody decides they're gonna get high on set. Personally, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. I've actually never tried drugs in my life. I don't care what other people do in their pastime, but I do not allow anyone to be under the influence when they're on set with me. Multiple reasons are for that. One is because if you break ghost gear, I mean that stupid little spirit box by itself, the PSB 11 is $200. I mean, I've had people break gear in the past. They're not gonna replace it. Like, come on, you know they're not gonna replace it. They're gonna disappear and that's gonna be the last you hear from them. So why would I want someone to be under the influence on set that breaks my gear that can't re afford to replace it? Another thing is, in all honesty, being under the influence of drugs or alcohol or whatever, 
can make you feel loosey-goosey and talk and chat and whatever and then all of a sudden they open themselves up because they're not guarded they're not just the naturally guarded and I really truly believe that you are much more susceptible to oppression possession that way like if you're under the influence versus if you were just normally on your own when I hire people I always ask them I don't care what you do in your personal time 72 hours before set, you will not be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. If I have any suspicions of it, I will remove the person for the night whenever we get to that city, and I will go place them in a hotel by themselves for the night. They will not investigate with us. I've had terrible things happen in the past by hiring irresponsible people. The Bross Hotel was not due to drugs and alcohol. It was just due to, I don't know. I really wish I could tell you when I train people to investigate or even like camera techs in the past I've hired students and then I'll exchange it for like internships and credits at their school for film studies um, or just sometimes they want to start building their resume I make them go through a pretty intense um, training session basically I make them learn ghost vocabulary I make them learn about every single up and down and backwards about ghost gear I don't want them to say the wrong thing or the inappropriate thing or they don't know how to explain something if they're doing some sort of a selfie shot while investigating. So I put investigators and crew through a decent amount of training. And for some reason with the Bross Hotel, it wasn't enough. So I will show the footage I have. I just don't want anybody making fun of anybody and I will kind of do a, um, a little blurb before I, I upload that for you guys. Okay, Miss Vicky is out there, Bounds for Beauty. She's awesome. She's been following me for quite a while, and I'm always chatting with Vicky online. Um, Vicky gave me a really creepy story regarding a doll. She had purchased like a brand new American uh, girl doll for, I think it was her daughter. Um, it wasn't recently, it was years ago, or maybe it was her granddaughter, I can't remember. She had some really terrible vibe about the, the doll. And then she was able to reach out to Ed and Lorraine Warren. That was before um, Ed had passed away. So basically, the, you know, the question is, what do I feel about dolls and clowns? I absolutely think that a doll or a clown or even an object can be, you know, attached or inhabited by some sort of an entity. But I'm not directly afraid of them. I know that sounds weird, but um, like if I were to see a clown on the street, like somebody dressed as a clown, I'm not afraid of that. I have a cousin that is deathly terrified of clowns. So I do get that phobia. Am I afraid of dolls? Not really. I mean like Doll Island in Mexico, like there's some weird stuff out there, right? But no, I'm not afraid of dolls. I actually have two dolls that I bought in Jerome. Um, from two of the times that I actually got to investigate. So one of the dolls I have is from Paranormal Challenge when I was down there with Zach and Travel Channel. And the other one is from the time that I talked about with John Kelly when the possession took place. So this is the doll that I bought when I was on set um, in Jerome for Paranormal Challenge. And um, the reason Jerome has the doctor dolls is because it was actually a hospital as you guys know. And I think that Aaron may have posted one, or um, purchased one too when we were there. But he has like a little rib cage, he's just a little skeleton doll. I have this guy actually, he hangs in my office. And then the last time that I went to Jerome again to film, I purchased a maid doll. So this is my little skeleton maid doll. And I, I got her just because I thought he was kind of lonely. So I have both of these guys hanging up in my office. Do I believe in stuff like Annabelle and, and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, it. the movie, though, once again, Hollywood, I think, portrayed it, like, really bad. I mean, Ed and Lorraine Warren do claim that the Annabelle, the Annabelle story was pretty intense and that she had a lot of power and, um, you know, really strange things like bugs and stuff would happen when it was around and out. Um, but once again, Hollywood, of course, stepped in and made everyone lose their minds because this doll... The doll in Hollywood does not look like the actual doll that Ed and Lorraine Warren have and it looks more like Raggedy Ann. Okay, Kansas Girl asked how I felt about locations, like big locations that we all know of like uh, Bobby Mackey's, uh, Stanley Hotel, Lizzie Borden. If there's so many investigators going in constantly, do I think it affects the energy and the atmosphere of the locations and the entities themselves? 100%. 100%. 
Couple examples are the Stanley Hotel used to be probably one of the uh, friendliest haunts that I had ever been to. And now they're claiming there's a bunch of dark stuff inside the Stanley Hotel. What could that be from? People could be going in there even just to stay as guests and they're summoning stuff in that they shouldn't. Bobby Mackey's I think is um, a big problem. I think that it's always been a big problem. I told you guys the experiences that I had at Bobby Mackey's, but I think that once Wanda and Bobby Mackey started allowing investigations to take place there, people were going in, they were not being supervised, and I think that they were provoking or bad things were happening, and I think it's just made it all the more worse. There's people that I know um, and uh, I've heard stories that they've gone to the Lizzie Borden house. That's in Fall River, Massachusetts. I've never made it up there. Eventually, I'm going to make it up there. But it, I've heard that basically the Bordens or whoever is there still is basically just over being communicated with. Like they're burnt out, they're tired, they don't want to communicate anymore, they don't care. Um, and so I guess like, you know, there's turned a little bit darker up in Fall River. So I don't know. I do agree with you 100% Kansas girl. You said, do you think it affects the atmosphere? Yeah, I think not always for the good, more for the worse. I grew up in Colorado. I grew up in Denver, which is about an hour away from Boulder, which is where Jean Benet died. If you don't know the story of Jean Benet, she was a young girl that was that was in all of the beauty pageants, i.e. like toddlers and tiaras. And Jean Benet was found murdered in her basement, um, like sexually molested, hung, and killed. No one really ever solved her murder. Nobody knew if it was her parents. Nobody knew um, what the deal was. I can't remember who asked me this and who I talked to about this. Remind me below. Somebody asked me, do I think that um, Jean Benet's house is still haunted? Uh, what was what what did I experience with that growing up since I lived in Colorado where that took place when Jean Benet was murdered I was in elementary school. I can't remember how old I was, but I do remember that the whole vibe of Colorado changed Colorado was very um, middle America um, very liberal very um, Not Republic not Democrat. Everything is just too extreme um, and there was not a lot of death and murders uh, when I grew up. So to hear about this this girl, um, basically someone broke in and took her into the basement, sexually molested her, and then killed her, uh, was just unspoke of. So I remember when that happened, and, and basically parents like locked their kids down. Like everyone in Colorado was afraid to let their kids out, and they were like paranoid, and like who was it? Until they catch the killer, we're not gonna know. So the next question is, do I think the house is haunted? Well, I'll tell you this for sure. There's been a lot of people that have tried to contact the new owners of the house to investigate. No one will let them in. That house, after Jean Benet was murdered, actually sat empty for a very long time. I didn't do the history research. If you guys want to look it up, feel free. Um, I think that because it had been attached to such a national story headline, no one wanted to live in that house. So they actually ended up changing the address, I believe, and that was how it was able to sell. Do I think it's haunted? I don't know. You know, if you ask my opinion, um, in a circumstance like that, I don't think uh, specifically Jean Benet would be lingering in the gray zone after she was murdered. Like, that's a really horrific death. I think that in that case, you would be more likely to go investigate the Jean Benet house and find actual evidence of um, residual activity or plasma because that was such a violent crime and a violent death and for an innocent child. I don't think that you would catch intelligent EVPs and if you did, I would be more concerned it was something malicious or something um, you know, non-fraudulent that was coming across as Jean Benet. Do I think it was her parents that did it? They're actually coming out with a couple of specials. On one, Dr. Phil is going to be finally talking with uh, Jean Benet's brother next month. Um, and he was younger than Jean Benet, if I remember correctly. So it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say regarding the murder. Because him and his parents were the only ones that were in the house the night she died. Um, and then they're also doing another special where they're, they have rebuilt the actual replica of the house in Hollywood. And they're going to recreate the, the murder of Jean Benet in the basement. 
um, and looking at all the possibilities of who would have been able to crawl in the window, would a, a grown person be able to get through the window. Um, I have a feeling that they're going to end up determining that it, it was probably more likely someone in the house like her parents. If you don't know the story, her parents are actually both dead. The father died first, I think, and then the mother ended up dying of cancer. I think that it was probably more than likely that the father um, um, killed Jean Benet. Do I think the house is haunted? If it's haunted, it's, it's probably more than likely haunted by the person that committed the crimes. And it's probably more than likely haunted by residual activity. Do I think Jean Benet is stuck there? No, absolutely not. I think that when children and, um, and animals die of horrific deaths like that, I think that they cross over much quicker than anything because maybe guides or angels, whatever on the other side, tries to sweep them in as quickly as possible so they don't linger. If someone were to go in and get a, an EVP of a child um, in Jean Benet's house, I would, I would be more afraid of the EVP being um, something dark, um, malicious, possibly demonic. I'm not sure if that's really appropriate in this case, but. One of the things that I'm always most leery of, and I, and I teach this with my investigators and anybody that's um, investigating, is ghosts and getting EVPs of children are the most dangerous kind. And that's because it is more likely to be fraudulent or malicious if you're getting a child EVP. Now wait a second, I'm not saying go in and if you get a kid EVP, go in and provoke and be like, you're a stupid demon, come up out of that hole and get us. No, 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 I'm not saying that either. But I'm saying that um, malicious entities, whether it's a, whether it's an alien life form or a demon or um, something just plain dark, they will come through more often as children through EVPs because as an adult, you want to trust a child or you hear a child of an EVP and, and you're a mom or an aunt or a grandma and you're like, oh my God, it's a little child and they're stuck here and I have to do whatever I can to cross them over. And then pretty soon, they're, you're welcoming to that child EVP or whatever it was you got and then the, this thing is like, ooh, I got, I got its attention and now I can go home with them and I'm gonna latch my claws in and I'm gonna follow that person and then that's how you get attachments and demonic hauntings and your life turns upside down and, and it turns into hell. I'm not saying that every 100% of children EVPs or activity is a demon or something bad. I am just saying it is more than likely to not be a child than it is to be a child and that's just in my experience. We can go into that more further later. I just wanted to talk to you guys about the Jean Benet case. Um, do I think her house is haunted? Not by Jean Benet. I have heard through the grapevine of locals in Colorado and people that live near that house in Boulder that the house has had activity. No one's gonna know until they're in there with equipment and they're, in, they're able to investigate. But may little Jean Benet rest in peace. The last thing I wanna talk to you guys about is I was going to make this an official review and I, to be honest, don't wanna waste my time making an actual review for this. They, they do this like the devil's toy box and they um, basically it is like if Honey Boo Boo met Ghost Hunters. To be honest with you, I have watched one episode and then I watched the Halloween special. I only watched the Halloween special because Chip Coffee was in it. And the Bishop. I follow the Bishop on social media. I was extremely disappointed in who they were as people. There's an episode that I watched and I think that they were either in Tennessee or Kentucky. So their gimmick is they like to go to asylums and um, provoke dark stuff or demons and uh, try to release them or release whatever's trapped. They went into some old army camp and provoked the shit out of it and they were completely convinced that it was basically mostly or all demons inside of this army camp. Army asylum, that's what I meant. Or military asylum. Any intelligent investigator knows wherever you are investigating, Lizzie Borden house, Bobby Mackey's is a little bit of a mixed bag, 
Stanley Hotel has a couple of the past owners and builders from the Stanley Hotel. Maids, stuff like that. Anywhere you go to investigate, you have to know somewhere in your mind that more than likely you're going to run into something that is related to that location. They were more than likely to run into military personnel that died in there that was an asylum, more than likely that they were run into a demon or something dark. Therefore, they should have gone in only respectful to the entities in there. I don't even know where to begin. I'm going to try to be as poised as I can, but I will say that they were the most disrespectful bunch of ghost hunters that I've ever seen in my life on this episode. Instead of going in respecting veterans, respecting the military that <clears throat> more than likely died there, I didn't look up the history of this location from the military. More than likely, there were injured soldiers that <clears throat> that went to this location after wars and basically started provoking and um, saying they were gonna catch whatever was in there and get it out. I hate more than anything when people disrespect veterans. I can't help it. Probably because Blake's a veteran, I volunteer you know, to help veterans. I think that the VA is such a screwed up system anyways. These guys are trained soldiers. They are trained military. They went to basic training, they go to IT camps, whether they're in infantry or artillery or a medic or whatever, and then they go to war, they come home, the VA doesn't take care of them, they never have, and then they're going to go die in an asylum or die in a hospital, and or sometimes they're going to commit suicide because the VA has lacked to help them. I think the last thing that they need after serving this country and making us what we are as America, which is freedom, is to be disrespected in the afterlife. Sorry, that's just how I feel. Was so disgusted with how they handled this military asylum or location, I have apt to never watch them again. What they ended up doing was taking something like it may have been the devil's toy box, I'm not sure. They claimed that they captured something from this military hospital or asylum and they took it out into a field and they blew it up because they said it was a demon and they said they were going to release it. First of all, how do they know it's a demon? If they have a way I, they can communicate and they can distinguish, like there's four ghosts standing in front of me, this one's a demon and these three are I. If they have a way to distinguish that, I wish that they'd give me a call and let me know because I'm pretty sure not one of them on their team is a psychic. And with that being said, let's just play devil's advocate. On one side, I really highly freaking doubt that they captured anything in the devil's toy box or in any sort of box for that matter. So why are they blowing it up just for this dramatic show? I highly doubt anything was caught or captured anyways. But let's play on the other side of Devil's Advocate and say in this little tiny freaking box that they did capture a soul. Let's say it wasn't a demon because I don't know how they would determine that it was or wasn't. Let's say instead they've captured the soul of one of our, one of our soldiers that's a veteran that passed away at that hospital. And inside this box, they decide to go take it because now it's trapped from the mirrors and however the devil's toy box works. And now they're going to go take it out to a freaking field and blow it up. So you're just like going to start blowing up souls now? Like, who died and made you God? Like, I'm sorry. I don't care if you're atheist, agnostic, whatever. That is disrespectful as I don't like veterans being... Being... Dist, disrespected, I don't like it. I don't know if it's ignorance, if they're uneducated, um, if they're just disrespectful assholes, whatever it is, I vowed to never watch them again. I did make the decision to watch their last year's Halloween special and that's because they had the bishop and they had chip coffee. Chip coffee did great, the bishop did great, but then they brought in this giant devil's toy box that they made um, and they basically locked one of their investigators in it, which is all these mirrors. Look up a devil's toy box if you don't know what it is. Basically, because the mirrors are infinite and they face each other, if you can trap something in there, um, they tried to trap something in there with one of their investigators. <clears throat> he sat inside of this giant. He sat inside of this giant mirrored box. I love Chip Coffee. I know he's legit. I've met him. I think he's awesome. 
I love the bishop because he only does, you know, work in the name of God or the name of the Lord um, to try to help cleanse and, and revive people of nasty things they've been through. He's the same bishop that relieved Zach when he was on set at the Bobby Mackey's investigation. Got a really bad taste in my mouth from that because I think the number one thing in this field is respect. When you start an investigation, you need to go in respectful because you're in their house, they're not in yours. And you definitely don't go in where people have served and it's 90% more than likely to run into a soldier that's a veteran that probably died from neglect from the system or possibly war. You don't go in there, provoke, taunt, and then claim that you captured them and blew them up. And I'm sorry, but there is a huge possibility that they were right. They found some mean, angry spirit, and it wasn't a demon, it was a pissed off veteran. Probably because he died too early, or because he died of neglect from the VA system, or he died from injuries due to war. I would be pissed too if that were me, and I would still be haunting shit in the afterlife because I had unfinished business and I wasn't freaking ready to go. So I'm sorry, but like I get passionate about this because this is not, I don't see this as like ghosts and ghost hunting. This is just another realm. That's what I think of it as. It's just a very different realm on a different level that we're just not visibly seeing or interacting with visibly. And I don't think that realm should be disrespected. I'm mainly talking about human interaction, even if it's a pissed off spirit. I've told you guys over and over, you are more than likely to be running into a mad pissed off spirit human that used to be here and died for whatever reason, more than likely to run into that than you are a demon. That's a very rare chance you're gonna run into a demon. I've done a lot of investigations, I'm just being honest. Hollywood has blown it way out of proportion. But don't freaking disrespect the dead. Don't disrespect our veterans. I don't care if they're dead or alive. Oh my God, it is, it is terribly rude. It is terribly disrespectful and completely offensive. These people have served our country. There is a lot of freaking bases that are haunted. Fort Carson, I was at Fort Carson in Colorado. It's haunted, it's very haunted. There's buildings on Fort Carson they won't let you go to anymore because it's so haunted. Fort Knox is so haunted. In fact, I know that I have veterans out there watching me because I talk to you guys and you guys know that I love veterans and you guys know I love you guys. Tell me haunted locations that from the military that you know about. How many freaking Navy ships are haunted? We know this. Blake worked at Walter Reed. Do you want to know how freaking haunted Walter Reed is? I, I think that's like the oldest, if not one of the oldest bases in the United States. There are parts of Walter Reed that are like buildings that they've basically condemned and shut down. And it's mainly because people will get injured in there from like dead soldiers. Like they're just pissed off roaming. So they've literally had to shut parts of Walter Reed down and you can't access it anymore. The old base before they rebuilt it. So anyway, just don't disrespect these guys. And with that being said, don't disrespect any dead. And don't provoke the demons because I've said this before. If you call for the devil, the devil's gonna come knocking and make sure you can handle what he hands you. Please give me good comments below. Please give me a thumbs up if you haven't already. Please make sure you subscribe to my channel. I love it when you guys message me and leave me comments. I love to chat with you guys. Anything that you want to hear about next or talk with, I will for sure answer your questions and I will catch you guys next time. We're back from dead. And um, basically he went to sleep, um, he overdosed on pain medication, it was an accidental overdose, and uh, he went to sleep and never woke up. And because it was the evening before, nobody found him until the next day. And um, I mean, I don't think he could have been saved at that point anyways, but since everybody was in bed, by the time they had found him was like eight or 10 hours later, uh, he hadn't gotten out of bed. He was completely cold and like rigor mortis had set in. And um, 
we were shot like we were stunned because it was a situation where nobody could have prevented it. It wasn't like when you see a family member like pass out from choking or like have a heart attack and drop to the floor and like you can call 911 and try to prevent it from happening. It happened 8 hours ago. There is no reviving this person and there's it's completely out of your control, completely. So it was a very strange situation for me. Um the other thing was is that my cousin was younger than me. So it was really hard um, like the first time you have a family member die that's younger than you, it's just, it, it's weird. It's just really strange. That was really hard. Um, obviously it wasn't my fault. I mean, I didn't, it's not like I could have predicted that, but it, it was, it was like a sign that I was getting. The reason I'm bringing this up is that last week I had some weird stuff happen. Some of you guys follow me on social media, some of you don't. I was going to write a blog on my ghostgirldiaries.org, but I thought, you know what, I should just like chat about this with you guys because so many of you were interacting with me on different platforms of social media and when I was able to finally research it enough, I thought, I, I was like exploding wanting to talk about it and, and tell you guys about it. In case you don't know, um, about a week ago, my mom was in our backyard and um, she she had taken my dogs out to go to the bathroom or you know hang outside or whatever and she started to shout and if you couldn't tell by now Blake and I live together um, and we've been in a relationship for four years uh, she's shouting and screaming so Blake and I ran to the door to see what was going on and she said that um, something like the, she thought there was like a bird attacking another bird or something we just she couldn't tell and there was an injured bird that was on the ground Blake was a combat medic um, in the army and so he ran to go see, well, we both ran out to go see what was happening. Now, the, the portion of my backyard is, is really big. Um, it's really, you, it takes a minute to get to it um, really far, like maybe, maybe 25 feet, something like that. So as we're walking up to this injured bird, there's an injured bird on the ground. On our back uh, fence, there is a jet black hawk. I mean jet black. It looks as if the hawk would have been hunting this bird. The time that it takes for you to walk to where our back door is, all the way over to where this bird was on the ground, if the hawk was in fact hunting this bird, it could have swooped, it would have had plenty of time because of the length we had to get to it. The hawk did not go after this bird once. So Blake is more concerned about the bird on the ground and I'm watching the hawk. So. Blake's on the ground um, looking at the bird. It's not bleeding. It doesn't have a broken neck. It doesn't have a broken wing. Um, there's no signs of trauma. There's no broken legs. So Blake puts, he kind of cups his hands like this and this little bird um, ends up jumping into his hands. And that's when we realize that it's, um, it's a sparrow. It's not a baby, but it's, it's a sparrow. Now I'm like getting really upset because you guys know I'm an empath and like I get really, I don't like death like that, you know, like I don't like any sort of traumatic death or anything like that. Of course I'm getting emotional and like choked up and this hawk, I'm talking black hawk, is huge, like huge, huge and he's standing on um, the ledge of, of our fence and we have like big concrete fences, they're like, they're not typical six foot fences, they're like um, about eight foot fences. And the reason they have those in Vegas is most people have like swimming pools and like backyards where they have like, you know, friends over because it's, you know, 70 degrees in December here. So like, it's kind of always pool weather here. Back, back, back from the dead. <laughs> I guess I'm about to like nerd out on you guys for a minute, but it's so fitting. Some of you guys know that I'm like 
a World of Warcraft nerd. I play WoW. I've played for years, to be honest. And like, four years, I love healers, so usually I'm like a Blood Elf Pally. Yeah, I'm for the Horde, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like a week ago, they came out with a new class for it, and it's called the Demon Hunter. And so I, I, I did, I nerded out, and I made a Demon Hunter. So this is my Demon Hunter. It's actually been really fun to play. I don't play as much as I used to. I just don't have the time. But if you're looking for a new guild, you know, I am the GM on my server. Anyway, enough nerding out. What's up guys? I have a bunch of questions from all of you that I have compiled and let's chat. <clears throat> it's my handy dandy little notebook. So this was, this was gonna, you know, I was gonna rant and then I decided there's just no point to rant. If you guys follow me on social media like Twitter or Facebook or any of those, then you will know that Somebody decided to message me on YouTube leaving a comment saying that women shouldn't be paranormal investigators and they shouldn't be ghost hunters. He told me that I was not being very ladylike and he told me I needed to stop and start doing more feminine things. Excuse me? Do you know who you're talking to? Excuse me? Who? Who are you? So you know what? Instead of getting mad, instead of getting, you know, any sort of upset and reacting, I am going to put a shout out to all of the paranormal girls. All of my paranormal girls that are out there right now. I talk to you guys almost every single day. I know that you're out there. I think I have created like the best, you know, community of female ghost hunters and paranormal investigators. For a long time I actually had, you know, a majority, like high majority was the male side. And now after all this time, like I've got all you girls out there that are like badass chicks that are following me and all of us support each other. So where are my paranormal girls at? I don't know what, you know, what does gender have to do with anything? Ladylike, well, I guess you got me there because you wouldn't want to hang out with me like on a day-to-day -day basis because I'm probably definitely not ladylike. I'm for sure like I love makeup and I love hair and I love fashion because I was into cosmetology. But yeah, you're right. You got me there. I'm not ladylike. I'm cool with that. I was always the chick that had like mainly dudes, mainly guy friends. I just admitted that I play World of Warcraft on social media. I'm not ashamed of who I am and if you think ghost hunting and paranormal investigating is masculine, then I blame the media for that because there is no female lead investigators out there. And I have told all of you guys over and over, that's gotta change at some point. So whoever you are, Mr know-it-all out there watching. Thank you for adding more fuel to my fire to just continue on the path that I'm on to hopefully pool season weather. And so this, this hawk is huge and it's sitting up here and he's got his wings out and he's like, he's doing this like up and down thing and he's, it's kind of like dancing back and forth across the fence. And he's looking at me and he's just watching me. And I'm like so confused to like, like if this ho if this hawk's wanting to eat this bird or whatever it could have done it like and and on now we're like just a few feet away from the hawk and the hawk is not afraid it's not it's not trying to fly away it's not um it's not intimidated it's not threatened so finally the hawk starts like squawking now it's not a squawk like a it wasn't like i want that prey it wasn't like it was yelling at us it was like it was just like a kind of peaceful communicating. And so Blake is like just worried about the sparrow because it's like it's it's on the ground. It, it looks like it can't fly. We can't get it to fly. We don't know what's wrong. And I'm like, what do I do with this hawk? Like, I don't know what to do. So I went up to the hawk and I got really close to it. And it did this like bow thing and it like, it like closed its eyes, the hawk, and they're huge. Um, it wasn't an eagle, it was definitely a hawk, and it has the beak, and it did this, like, head bow, 
and then it looked at me and then it turned and flew away and I'm like I'm in such a weird emotional state because like on one side I'm like oh my god this poor poor bird is like something's wrong with it and then on the other side I'm like what the hell was this thing like this hawk thing about like and then I'm like Blake's upset because he's trying to help the bird and then I'm just like emotional so Blake's like yelling so Blake has it picked up and it's very gently it's in his palms and it's alive and it's chirping and it's it's it sounds like it's singing a little bit and chirping once again there's no visible injuries <clears throat> so Blake looks at me and he goes I need you to go in the house I want you to grab a towel I want you to get some water um, and then get a little box because I think we're gonna have to take it to a vet so in the meantime I told my mom to get on the internet and start looking up vets that can help there's a lot of wildlife reservations here so I'm in the house now I'm crying like I'm full Oprah crying and I'm like uh, I, don't, uh, I need like any water and I need a bowl and like I'm like just can't so all of a sudden I don't even know it was like it was like some tranquility came over me and I was like I can't control this situation at all so I said what is the only thing that you can think to do that can help this bird other than like you know us as humans and the first thing I thought was well I'm gonna shout for Saint Michael to come down and who's the Archangel you know he helps like I told you guys to use him like he's my homeboy if you feel like you have anything dark or negative in your house Saint Archangel Saint Michael will come down and like remove that shit like really quick um he's basically the Archangel that fights demons or the dead or anything that's dark that you don't want in your house or around you and then I called for Saint Ariel and Saint Ariel is um She's the archangel of like nature and animals and you know anything outdoors. So I start like crying and I'm like because I, I don't know what to do. So I'm like, I'm like you know Saint Michael, Saint Ariel, please come down and help this bird. I don't know what to do if it's in pain, um, and we can't help it. Please take its pain away. Please help it, help it cross over. Please help it. Um, I mean, you know, I didn't know. I was just like spouting off whatever I could think of. So now by the time I've like circled the house to like get everything that, that he's asked for, I go rushing outside and Blake looks at me and he's got the little sparrow in his hand and he's like, he's like, he passed. And I was like, lost it. Like crying, like I was so upset. So we had to have like a little funeral and like all, it was just, it was so sad. He said that he looked up at him and chirped at him and just, set his little head down, closed his eyes, and just, and that was it. He stopped breathing. Um, we watched him for, you know, a while to see if maybe he just, he was going to get better, and he didn't. And he creates feminism in the paranormal. And you're right. I'm, I'm not ladylike. Anyway, moving on, let's go on to the next subject. I just want to address it because I thought it'd be fun, right? It was fun, right? Paranormal omens and superstitions. Okay, a lot of people, you know, have superstitions. A lot of people believe in omens, like the Grim Reaper. Uh, if you don't know about omens or superstitions, most of these actually trace all the way back to the Romans or even the Greek. So this is like, you think that you saw the Grim Reaper and um, it really was just some dude with a cloak walking down the street. Who walks with a cloak down the street? But because you saw the Grim Reaper, you're gonna die. Like, you're, you were completely convinced you're going to die. You're driving late at night and you see a black cat cross your path. And that's another omen. That if you see a black cat, like, that's a sure sign for death. Crows, ravens. I, I think an, an old school one is when your bird flies into your house, someone in the household's going to die if, if the bird dies from, like, falling into your window. Think about how paranoid all of us would be 24-7 if we read into every little thing like that that we saw. Do I believe in any of these omens that I just talked about or any omens in particular? No, I can't say that I do. In fact, I have now owned two black Bombay cats. My first cat I had, um, I got him in like second grade. His name was Max. And Max lived to be like 19 years old, like he was an old man and uh, sadly he passed away in my early 20s. But then a few years ago, my cousin's cat got pregnant and I went to go pick out this cat. So I picked out one of the kittens 
and he was so tiny and cute and it was the only boy in the litter and he was like this big like if you've ever seen little tiny kittens he was like this big and he was um, gray and white and I actually named him Fade and the reason I named him Fade was because um, his head was white and the rest of his body was gray and he faded from um, white to gray and then slowly over time my freaking cat turned out to be this giant 28 pound panther Bombay cat so actually that's kind of funny if you're talking about like superstitions or omens or predictions when my cat Max died the last day we had him before we had to go put him down he like he wasn't eating he wasn't walking like he I mean I, I like to think to leave things or beings natural, like let them naturally go, but like he was suffering, like he was just a bag of bones. And so the night before I took Max in t um, to the vet, I, I literally sat down with him for like an hour and I was like, Max, I want you to know, I was like, I really love you so much, I'm so sad you have to go. And I said, but if there's any way you could come back to me someday, I'm not going to look for another cat. I'm just going to let it happen naturally and, and I hope that you come back in my life. So I went to my cousins, I got this little kitten thinking it was not a black Bombay cat and this cat turned into a, a panther bigger than Max and Max was a giant Bombay as well. I don't know if it's Max reincarnated, they have the exact same temperament, the same personality for sure. They're both giant cats, but Fade is my cat, and he he's my baby, and uh, he's, he's a big boy. Do I think black cats cause death? Well, if that were the case, then I've had a, a black cat my whole life, so I think I'm good. So no, when it comes to like silly superstitions like that stuff, I don't believe in that kind of thing. I do believe that we as humans can develop our own omens and superstitions over time, but it's really personal and specific to your life. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna give you an example. When I was like, let's see, I was like 20 or 21, I had bought a car, I bought a Mustang. It was a blue Mustang. And, cause I've, I've only ever driven Mustangs, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I had this Mustang and I had uh, the same day that I got the Mustang, I was given this necklace. And the necklace had this like fancy antique um, key on it. It was like the old school keys that they would have used like in the hotels or whatever you know back in the day. It was not a real key. It wasn't used for anything. It was just a giant key. I wore that necklace forever. I don't know why. I just wore it forever. So every day like in the shower every, all the time. All of a sudden one day like nine months later after I had bought my Mustang I realized that the key had broke off the necklace. Now it wasn't like a gold, it wasn't even silver, it just, it was, you know, costume jewelry. And I don't know where I, I lost the key, but for some reason, that made me really paranoid in my head. And I don't, I don't really know why. I went home that day and tried to get it off my mind. And I woke up the next day and I went to leave to go to work. And as I walked outside of my house, I usually had, I had parked my Mustang in the driveway and my Mustang was gone. Brand new, brand new Mustang. And so I'm like, I, I, I can't tell you guys how that feels. Like unless you've had a vehicle stolen or like repossessed, like I can't tell you how that feels. It's surreal. Like in your head, you're like trying to like make, so you're like, did I park it down the street? Did I, um, did I get drunk down at like the corner bar and like leave it there? No, I didn't, I didn't do that. Just like you're like thinking like where did I put my car like as if it wasn't there the night before. My car had been stolen. It had been stolen and uh, I, I did get it back in a couple pieces. It had been wrecked. It, it was really badly wrecked. So anyway, um, you know, maybe a year or two down the road, obviously I didn't have that car anymore. I had uh, just rented my first like out of out of an apartment. I'm in a townhouse now um, with my boyfriend at the time. And so I, I the same day, once again, I got a necklace key from a family member. And honestly, I'm not really correlating this at that point. I wore the necklace and one day I was at work, the same thing kind of happened again. 
um, the, the key broke off from the necklace. When I had gotten home that night, someone had broke into my apartment. Now once again, that wasn't a real key. It was just like a looky-loo necklace. The same scenario happened a couple years later. I was given a necklace key, the key broke off. One random day in that same day, my house was broken in. My own superstition at this point, I am like, I don't believe in coincidences. Like when things like that happen like over and over and it's a similar situation, I don't believe in coincidences. Like especially being in the industry of like the paranormal and the supernatural, I refuse to have a key necklace or anything that looks like a key in my house. I absolutely refuse it. And I used to love keys. Like I, I used to just like, um, you know, wall art that was like metal wall art of keys. I refuse to have any of that in my house now because it like, it freaked me out so bad. Like I don't want to ever have to go through any of that scenario again. So that's my own superstition. An omen, like, you know, I've, I've had omens before, but I they're not like um, the Grim Reaper walking in or something like that. I've told you guys this before. My cousin died in June of this year and two weeks, for two weeks before my cousin passed away, I was having dreams that someone was going to die. And I can't tell you what the dreams were. It wasn't like I was interacting with my spirit guide or a person. It was just a dream. And in the dream, I don't, I don't know if it was like my voice in my head, you know, when you dream or what, but I knew someone was going to die. So for two weeks, I'm like, I'm talking to my mom. I'm, I'm telling Blake. I'm like, something's going to happen. Like, I just know something's going to happen. Someone's going to die. I couldn't tell you who it was. I didn't, I wasn't like predicting. Like, I'm not claiming to be psychic whatsoever. I was just having this dream over and over of, of someone was gonna die. So we were always on the phone like with our family, like how's everybody doing? Everyone was doing fine. And then all of a sudden, sporadically, we get a phone call that my cousin passed away in the middle of the night, randomly. No one, you know, it was not planned. It wasn't expected. It was definitely not expected. Out there, I think I have created like the best, you know, community of female ghost hunters and paranormal investigators. For a long time, I actually had, you know, a majority, like high majority was the male side. And now after all this time, like I've got all you girls out there that are like badass chicks that are following me and all of us support each other. So where are my paranormal girls at? I don't know what, you know, what does gender have to do with anything? Ladylike, well, I guess you got me there because you wouldn't want to hang out with me like on a day-to-day -day basis because I'm probably definitely not ladylike. I'm for sure like I love makeup and I love hair and I love fashion because I was into cosmetology. But yeah, you're right. You got me there. I'm not ladylike. I'm cool with that. I was always the chick that had like mainly dudes, mainly guy friends. I just admitted that I play World of Warcraft on social media. I'm not ashamed of who I am and if you think ghost hunting and paranormal investigating is masculine, then I blame the media for that because there is no female lead investigators out there. And I have told all of you guys over and over, that's gotta change at some point. So whoever you are, Mr know-it-all out there watching. Thank you for adding more fuel to my fire to just continue on the path that I'm on to hopefully create feminism in the paranormal. And you're right, I'm, I'm not ladylike. Anyway, moving on, let's go on to the next subject. I just want to address it because I thought it'd be fun, right? It was fun, right? Paranormal omens and superstitions. Okay, a lot of people, you know, have superstitions. A lot of people believe in omens, like the Grim Reaper. Uh, if you don't know about omens or superstitions, most of these actually trace all the way back to the Romans or even the Greek. So this is like, you think that you saw the Grim Reaper and um, it really was just some dude with a cloak walking down the street. Who walks with a cloak down the street? But because you saw the Grim Reaper, you're gonna die. Like, you're, you were completely convinced you're going to die. You're driving late at night and you see a black cat cross your path. And that's another omen that if you see a black cat, like that's a sure sign for death. 
crows, ravens. I, I think an, an old school one is when your bird flies into your house, someone in the household's going to die if, if the bird dies from like falling into your window. Think about how paranoid all of us would be 24 seven if we read into every little thing like that that we saw. Do I believe in any of these omens that I just talked about or any? Back, back, back from the dead. <laughs> I guess I'm about to like nerd out on you guys for a minute, but it's so fitting. Some of you guys know that I'm like a World of Warcraft nerd. I play WoW. I've played for years to be honest and like four years. I love healers. So usually I'm like a blood elf pally. Yeah, I'm for the horde. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like a week ago they came out with a new class for it and it's called the Demon Hunter. And so I, I, I did, I nerded out and I made a demon hunter. So this is my demon hunter. It's actually been really fun to play. I don't play as much as I used to. I just don't have the time. But if you're looking for a new guild, you know, I am the GM on my server. Anyway, enough nerding out. What's up guys? I have a bunch of questions from all of you that I have compiled and let's chat. <clears throat> it's my handy dandy little notebook. So this was, this was gonna, you know, I was gonna rant, and then I decided there's just no point to rant. If you guys follow me on social media like Twitter or Facebook or any of those, then you will know that somebody decided to message me on YouTube, leaving a comment saying that women shouldn't be paranormal investigators and they shouldn't be ghost hunters. He told me that I was not being very ladylike and he told me I needed to stop and start doing more feminine things. Excuse me? Do you know who you're talking to? Excuse me? Who? Who are you? So you know what, instead of getting mad, instead of getting, you know, any sort of upset and reacting, I am going to put a shout out to all of the paranormal girls, all of my paranormal girls that are out there right now. I talk to you guys almost every single day. I know that you're out. Omens in particular, no, I can't say that I do. In fact, I have now owned two black Bombay cats. My first cat I had, um, I got him in like second grade. His name was Max. And Max lived to be like 19 years old. Like he was an old man. And uh, sadly he passed away in my early 20s. But then a few years ago, my cousin's cat got pregnant. And I went to go pick out this cat. So I picked out one of the kittens and he was so tiny and cute and it was the only boy in the litter. And he was like this big, like if you've ever seen little tiny kittens, he was like this big. And he was um, gray and white and I actually named him Fade. And the reason I named him Fade was because um, his head was white and the rest of his body was gray and he faded from um, white to gray. And then slowly over time, my freaking cat turned out to be this giant 28 pound panther Bombay cat. So actually that's kind of funny if you're talking about like superstitions or omens or predictions. When my cat Max died, the last day we had him before we had to go put him down, he like, he wasn't eating, he wasn't walking, like he, I mean, I, I like to think to leave things or beings natural, like let them naturally go. But like he was suffering, like he was just a bag of bones. And so 
the night before I took Max in t um, to the vet, I, I literally sat down with him for like an hour and I was like, Max, I want you to know. I was like, I really love you so much. I'm so sad you have to go. And I said, but if there's any way you could come back to me someday, I'm not going to look for another cat. I'm just going to let it happen naturally. And, and I hope that you come back in my life. So I went to my cousins. I got this little kitten thinking it was not a black Bombay cat. And this cat turned into a, a panther bigger than Max. And Max was a giant Bombay as well. I don't know if it's Max reincarnated. They have the exact same temperament, the same personality for sure. They're both giant cats. But Fade is my cat and he he's my baby. And uh, he's, he's a big boy. Do I think black cats cause death? Well, if that were the case, then I've had a, a black cat my whole life, so I think I'm good. So no, when it comes to like silly superstitions like that stuff, I don't believe in that kind of thing. I do believe that we as humans can develop our own omens and superstitions over time, but it's really personal and specific to your life. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna give you an example. When I was like, let's see, I was like 20 or 21, I had bought a car, I bought a Mustang, it was a blue Mustang, and, cause I've, I've only ever driven Mustangs, I don't know what's wrong with me, and I had this Mustang, and I had uh, the same day that I got the Mustang, I was given this necklace, and the necklace had this like fancy antique um, key on it. It was like the old school keys that they would have used like in the hotels or whatever, you know, back in the day. It was not a real key. It wasn't used for anything. It was just a giant key. I wore that necklace forever. I don't know why. I just wore it forever. So every day, like in the shower, every, all the time. All of a sudden one day, like nine months later after I had bought my Mustang, I realized that the key had broke off the necklace. Now it wasn't like a gold, it wasn't even silver, it just, it was, you know, costume jewelry. And I don't know where I, I lost the key, but for some reason, that made me really paranoid in my head. And I don't, I don't really know why. I went home that day and tried to get it off my mind. And I woke up the next day and I went to leave to go to work. And as I walked outside of my house, I usually had, I had parked my Mustang in the driveway and my Mustang was gone. Brand new, brand new Mustang. And so I'm like, I, I, I can't tell you guys how that feels. Like unless you've had a vehicle stolen or like repossessed, like I can't tell you how that feels. It's surreal. Like in your head, you're like trying to like make, you're like, did I park it down the street? Did I, um, did I get drunk down at like the corner bar and like leave it there? No, I didn't, I didn't do that. Just like you're like thinking like where did I put my car like as if it wasn't there the night before. My car had been stolen. It had been stolen and uh, I, I did get it back in a couple pieces. It had been wrecked. It, it was really badly wrecked. So anyway, um, you know, maybe a year or two down the road, obviously I didn't have that car anymore. I had uh, just rented my first like out of out of an apartment, I'm in a townhouse now um, with my boyfriend at the time. And so, I, I the same day once again, I got a necklace key from a family member. And honestly, I'm not really correlating this at that point. I wore the necklace, and one day I was at work. The same thing kind of happened again. Um, the the key broke off from the necklace. When I had gotten home that night someone had broke into my apartment. Now once again, that wasn't a real key. It was just like a looky-loo necklace. The same scenario happened a couple years later. I was given a necklace key, the key broke off. One random day in that same day, my house was broken in. My own superstition at this point, I am like, I don't believe in coincidences. Like when things like that happen like over and over and it's a similar situation, I don't believe in coincidences. Like especially being in the industry of like the paranormal and the supernatural, I refuse to have a key necklace or anything that looks like a key in my house. I absolutely refuse it. And I used to love keys. Like I, I used to just like, um, you know, wall art that was like metal wall art of keys. I refuse to have any of that in my house now because it like, it freaked me out so bad. Like I don't want to ever have to go through any of that scenario again. So that's my own superstition. An omen, like, you know, I've, I've had omens before, but I, they're not like 
um, the Grim Reaper walking in or something like that. I told you guys this before. My cousin died in June of this year and two weeks, for two weeks before my cousin passed away, I was having dreams that someone was going to die. And I can't tell you what the dreams were. It wasn't like I was interacting with my spirit guide or a person. It was just a dream. And in the dream, I don't I don't know if it was like my voice in my head, you know, when you dream or what, but I knew someone was gonna die. So for two weeks, I'm like, I'm talking to my mom, I'm I'm telling Blake, I'm like, something's gonna happen. Like I just know something's gonna happen. Someone's going to die. I couldn't tell you who it was. I didn't, I wasn't like predicting, like I'm not claiming to be psychic whatsoever. I was just having this dream over and over of, of someone was going to die. So we were always on the phone like with our family, like how's everybody doing? Everyone was doing fine. And then all of a sudden sporadically we get a phone call that my cousin passed away in the middle of the night randomly. No one, you know, it was not planned. It wasn't expected it was definitely not expected and um, basically he went to sleep um, he overdosed on pain medication it was an accidental overdose and uh, he went to sleep and never woke up and because it was the evening before nobody found him until the next day and um, I mean I don't think he could have been saved at that point anyways but since everybody was in bed by the time they had found him was like eight or ten hours later uh, he hadn't gotten out of bed. He was completely cold and like rigor mortis had set in and um, it, we were shocked, like we were stunned because it was a situation where nobody could have prevented it. It wasn't like when you see a family member like pass out from choking or like have a heart attack and drop to the floor and like you can call 911 and try to prevent it from happening. It happened eight hours ago. There is no reviving this person and there's it's completely out of your control completely so it was a very